Thank you. So, good morning, officially, to everyone. Um, as Pastor Bill mentioned, my name is Jimmy. I'm one of the pastors here at New Day Community Church. And um, you know, every week we, we have an opportunity to give financially. And I just want to point you in this format to newdaycommunity.org slash give. Uh, any, any and all of the different ways that you can give can be kind of seen there. And for those of you who tend to give in person, um, what we what we just recommend is to, to do in the same way, uh, fill out your your um, a, a check, and you can just mail it to um, to the church. If you have any any questions, you can reach out to us about that. But um, I wanted to just draw our attention to to this this moment here. Every every week when we gather, we have an opportunity to give, and and, and sometimes it's so. Um, kind of assumed that, that we know why, that we know kind of what's behind it. But I just want to real quick this morning mention three, three different ways or three different reasons that we, that we do this week in and week out. Uh, one, one of the main reasons is that throughout the Bible we see that people honored God with their possessions. That, that whatever God had given them, whatever God had blessed them with, whatever resources God had given them, there was this, there was this thing of honoring God with what he had given them. Right, we, we read in, in, in the book of James that every good and perfect gift comes from, from God. Uh, it, Paul says it like this, what do you have that you have not received? Right, there's this reality that, that we've been given so much, everything we have comes from God. And so we honor God by giving back to him a portion of what he's given to us. Another reason that we, that we, that we give and we create space for the people of God to give weekly is that giving actually changes our hearts. That there's something about actually opening our hands with, what, with the limited resources that we have and giving generously that actually does something in our hearts to become more like our generous Father in heaven. And so there's just this reality, this inner work of God that happens when we, when we, when we trust Him in the act of giving. And then just a third way, real quick, is that giving fuels the church. Uh, we see in the book of Acts that as the church came together, that, that, that there, was this, there was this free and willing flow of generosity that happened in the church. And through that, the church was able to do a practical ministry of caring for the poor and, 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 loving the pra- and meeting the practical needs of those in their community and even outside of their community. And for some of us, um, if you're not kind of used to giving regularly, you may and for, for, for good reasons, be skeptical or kind of hesitant about that, um, that thing, largely because often you don't really know if, if you trust what your money is being used uh, toward. And there's, there's obviously in the church different ways, different abuses that have happened in the history. And so one of the, one of the things that we, that we care a lot about here at church is here at New Day is just uh, financial transparency and, and making sure that you know where all of the money you give goes. Um, in the last couple of weeks, we uh, gave out in, in person here the 2019 annual report. Uh, just in case anybody didn't get that or maybe didn't get, get a chance to hold on to it, we're going to be emailing that out later today just as a way to look at. In 2019, here's where all of your money went. Um, just And also to say, this is, this is something we care deeply about. Um, about about knowing where things are going and being open and honest with it, um, because here's the reality: is that at New Day we we have we have amb- we have goals, we have ambitions, and we 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 uh, we depend on the the reg- Pastor Cameron. Hey, let's let's just on your Facebook give a little thumbs up or a little heart or a little like hey, you know, your uh, virtual applause. Here we go. Thanks so much. We're going to continue our Emotional Healthy Community Series. This is an ongoing series, a nine-week series, and delving into the importance of emotional health, recognizing that our spiritual maturity can't really exceed our emotional maturity, that we are body, soul, and spirit, and all three need to mature in Christ. And so we're delving into this. And this is part. Uh, uh, this is the part called making the incarnation your model for living, or incarnational living. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the, uh, 
in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's, first John, that's John chapter 1, 1. A little bit further, verse 14, it says, And then the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And that's speaking of the person, Jesus Christ. So we learn from this passage that Jesus was in the beginning with God. In fact, in another place in Scripture, it says, By the word of Jesus' mouth, all things were created. And so Jesus was active in the creation, and uh, he is God, always was God, always will be God. But there was a moment in time when the Word became flesh, and we call that the incarnation. That's a big, long theological word. Incarnation means embodied in flesh, in human form. And that's easy, really, to remember. This is how I remember what it means. If you order chili con carne, con carne is with meat. All right? Con with carne is the Spanish based on the Latin root carne, which means flesh. <clears throat> con carne with meat, incarnate in meat, in flesh. And so it means God came in the flesh as a human. And throughout Scripture, it's very important, this, is, this idea is um, massive when you study Scripture, of the, the, the nature of God being in His creation. So throughout Scripture, God is actively involved in humanity in many different ways. It didn't start with Jesus, it actually started in the creation, in Genesis 1.1. Uh, but the fullest expression of that was when Jesus came in human form and he experienced every aspect of what it meant to be human from the point of conception all the way to the point of his death on the cross. Uh, later in John chapter 20, this is much later in Jesus' ministry, <clears throat> Jesus is speaking to his disciples. And it says, uh, he said to them, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Boom. All right. That should hit you like a spiritual brick. All right. This is a powerful, powerful statement. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you, Jesus said. And then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. So this means... As Jesus was called to live incarnate, we are called to live incarna incarnationally. We are called to live in the same way Christ did. And, and, and even more than that, like Christ being fully God and fully human, we also, all right, we're fully human. We got that part down. But when we receive the Holy Spirit, we have the fullness of God in us. So we can actually walk through our community, through our grocery stores, our neighborhood, in our homes, in the same way that Jesus did, being fully human, but also having in us the presence of God. So we are to be incarnate like Christ was incarnate. And we are sent to enter into the lives of others. And that's really the, the, the main point of this sermon is living incarnationally, living in the life of others, to learn how to get into the life of others in, in a similar way that Jesus entered into the humanity and entered into our lives. We are called to be like Jesus, entering into the lives of others, bringing the life of God, the message of God, and actually the, the heavenly presence uh, with us when we get in to other people's lives. 1 Corinthians 12, 27, another important verse that uh, helps us understand this idea. Uh, Paul writes that now, when? Now. Not someday, not when we get to heaven, not when we get all of our problems fixed. This is, he's writing to the church in Corinth. This is the church that had the most problems of all the churches <laughs> that are addressed in the Bible. He said, right now, now, Right now, you are the body of Christ. So he's talking collectively, as the church, we are the body of Christ. And as individuals, we're members of that body. And so each of us individually represent Christ, and we as a church corporately represent Christ. Quoting from the book that we're borrowing much of this content from, Peter Caceros, 
book on health, healthy emotional church. He writes, Today, God still has physical skin and can be seen, touched, heard, and tasted. How? Through his body, the church, in whom he dwells. We are called in the name of Jesus and by the indwelling Holy Spirit to be skin for people all around us. Wow, that's a tremendous calling that we are called to be Christ. There are many, many people uh, that their only uh, experience of Jesus is going to be how you represent Jesus to them. And you don't know who those people are. Some people may have other Christians in their life that can speak words of hope, that can hug them when they're hurting, that can pray for them when they're uh, suffering. But you may be the only one. And so every person in your life, you need to realize and ask yourself, how can I be Christ to that person? How can we actually do that? How can we make it real? And I, I acknowledge it's difficult. <clears throat> I, my life is just like yours. It's filled with lots of responsibilities, uh, uh, pressed for time. I have my own needs, my own troubles. And to stop and to think, how can I be Christ for this person that I'm encountering that maybe has done something that I am not even that happy about or that I see has a need? How can I get outside of myself like Jesus got, was, allowed himself to, to leave heaven Yet he got out of his comfort zone, didn't he? And so he calls us to do the same thing, to get out of our comfort zone and to enter in to other people's lives so that we can be uh, uh, Christ in their world. There's three dynamics for incarnational living. The first one is entering another's world. Entering another's world. 30 years of ministry, over 30 years of ministry, I've been uh, a pastor... <clears throat> And it's taught me if there's one thing that stands out uh, more than anything else is that I know less than I think. <laughs> All right. The longer I'm in ministry, the more I know that I don't know much. All right. It, it's it's kind of scary. <laughs> you realize how little you actually understand and, and that humbles you. Um. Every person's experience is unique. And frankly, it's arrogance to think I would know what someone else is going through. And so I, I try to be very careful. I, I try never to say, I know what you're feeling. Because, you know, I don't know what people are feeling. But I can say I share in your pain. Or I'm concerned for you. Or I care. There's ways that we can experience not assuming we know, but trying to learn. And we may have wisdom, actually. I, I, you know, again, over 30 years of counseling people in countless different situations, I have a lot of information. I've read hundreds of thousands of books. Uh, I have a lot of knowledge and wisdom that can help. Uh, but I must listen first to know what would really be helpful. And listening is a big part of learning how to enter another person's world. This is from the book. Being heard is so close to being loved that for the average person, they are almost indistinguishable. Wow. Just being heard to the average person means as much as being loved. In fact, uh, most people never are fully heard, and so they never experience the feeling of being loved and all we have to do is stop and listen and learn how to listen listening is a skill though that takes practice proverbs says it's uh he who answers a matter before he hears it it is folly and a shame to him of course i never do that <laughs> if my wife was here she would be correcting me she, when she watches this video she will correct me. <laughs> um, we all do this. We answer a matter before we hear it. In other words, when someone is speaking, we already come up with an answer in our brain. <laughs> and, and then often, we actually don't keep it in the brain. We actually start talking while they're still talking. And that means we haven't heard a matter fully. 
And the Bible says, you know, when you do that, it's, it's just being silly. It's foolish. And it's actually, it's just shameful to not fully hear before you form an answer. In the New Testament, James tells us, Beloved brethren, let every man, every person be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. And so we need to be very quick in hearing. Listen, listen to people's, and listen to them not just with your ears, but with your eyes and with your gut, with your, with your uh, uh, you know, look at their, uh, their nonverbals. Listen so that you can really understand and be slow to offer an opinion and definitely be slow to get angry or to get upset or to be uh, allow that to uh, stir up in your heart. Listening is really the best way we can enter into another person's world. You know, Jesus entered into a human flesh. How can we do that? Listening is really the key. When we, when we hear them out, we can, ex we can get a better glimpse of what they're uh, going through. And so I'm going to give you some tips, and these are um, a little bit adapted from Scazzaro's books. It's also, as I was reading through this, I was like, this is something that I've taught for years. Um, if you've had counseling sessions with me, uh, uh, it's, it's stuff that um, is, is well known and uh, something that I think is extremely important. Well, really, almost every time I do marriage counseling, this is one of the primary things I try to teach because in relationship, communication is so important and learning how to listen and listen incarnationally. I, I never use that term, but I like it. How to listen, incarnational listening is uh, very important in every relationship. And the better you are at practicing this, the better you will be at representing Christ to those in your world. So give your full attention. Don't prep your answer. In fact, what, what we were going to do in community groups is take time and actually practice this. I encourage you um, throughout the next weeks and really for the rest of your life, you know, to practice this. And, and by practicing it, you actually get someone else that's willing to, like your spouse or a friend, and say, okay, let's take the next 10 minutes and just and role play this act of listening. Because it takes practice to learn how to do this. So the tip number one is give your full attention. Don't, don't prepare an answer in your brain. Just listen to what they're saying, whoever you're with. Avoid judging. In other words, coming to a decision, whether they're right, wrong, or, or presenting information accurately. All of that needs to be set aside. You need to just really listen. Don't try to interpret that's, a, that's another thing we do. We take words and we interpret them rather than listening to them. Let them finish their sentences and their thoughts. And of course, don't interrupt. And then this is really key. This is called feedback. Reflect back as accurately as you can what you heard them say, word for word if possible. And when you learn how to do this well, you will be shocked. Because people will say something... And then you repeat back the exact same words, exact word for word. And nine out of ten times, they will say, no, that's not what I meant. Or that's not what I said. And that's not when you argue with them. Yes, it is what you said. <laughs> because when they hear their words repeated back to them, they, it then gives them the opportunity to refine the words. And they'll say, no, what I mean is... And then they'll say, say it a little differently. And then you actually repeat those same words back to them. And nine out of ten times they'll say, well, that's closer, but not quite. What I really mean is, and it takes several times of doing this for someone to find the words that expresses what they're thinking, experiencing, or feeling. And you need to take the time to listen to them. And then try to feel what they are feeling. That's called empathy. Try to, you know, if they're angry, don't just say, they shouldn't be angry. Try to go, oh man, I can kind of feel why you're angry. Or they're sad or disappointed or scared. Try to, try to tap into what they're feeling. And then ask, is there more? Huge, huge opportunity. Listen, there is always more. <laughs> always. Now, there is an appropriate time to say, okay, let's just stop there and let's, Let's delve into that. But people reveal stuff in layers. And they give the first layer, and that's usually more shallow. 
because they want to see if they can trust you, uh, how you respond to that level. And this is another little key thing. Many people get frustrated because they don't like small talk or shallow conversation. But let me give you a clue. That small talk is people testing you if they can trust you with deeper things like feelings and opinions and, 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 uh, and heartfelt issues. And so when you, when you listen and you respond without judging and, ask, and then ask for more, it's very important. And then it said, uh, also ask questions like, how did that make you feel? And so feeling, you try to get to the feeling level because that's, that's a place of intimacy. And also ask, of all that you've said, what's the most important part? What, what do you want me to really to remember? And sometimes that helps them focus on, uh, you know, what was significant to them. All of this is incarnational listening. Now, as you're doing this practice, or if you find yourself in this setting, which you should do regularly, you need to learn how to speak in this setting as well. So here's some tips on how to respond, or if you're the one speaking. Use I statements rather than you statements, okay? So rather than, <clears throat> if you're talking with your spouse, you always are so inconsiderate. That would be, you know, a bad thing to say. An unhelpful thing to say. But if you said, I feel as though you don't consider my feelings. Or you don't consider me when you do this. I feel, you know, that, that's not judging someone. That's just expressing, this is how I feel. I may be wrong, but this is how I feel. I feel um, ignored when this happens. I feel overlooked. Um, uh, I feel angry. The best way to express anger is verbally in an appropriate way. And so if you can learn how to say, actually, I really feel, I'm starting to feel angry about this situation. I think uh, it would be best to do this. You're using I statements rather than you statements. And talk about your thoughts. I think. Uh, I desire. I, I would, I, what I would really hope for. And then I feel. All of those things go to deeper levels in a conversation. Keep your statements brief. The longer you talk, the less can be retained. And so uh, take it in short steps. <clears throat> Say something. And then uh, let the listener paraphrase back to you what, they've said, what you've said. And you may even ask them, could you say back to me what I just said so that I know you've heard me correctly? Or maybe it'd be better so I know I've, I've communicated it well. Could you repeat what I just said to find out if I said it right? See how that helps? It opens up opportunity for, for conversation. And again, include feelings in your statements. Be honest. Obviously, be honest. You can't have a genuine conversation if you're, if you're distorting facts. Try to be clear, direct, and always, always respectful. And then <clears throat> as you're speaking, if you're the one uh, giving feedback, validate others before giving advice. So in other words, say something that I love and respect you. I, I just think you're fantastic. And, and I, I just, uh, if I've heard you correctly, this is what you've said. And um, can I share this? You know, and ask permission to share. So both of those are uh, uh, tips for learning how to listen incarnationally and how to speak incarnationally. It's, it's learning how to use conversation language to get into other people's lives in a deeper way so that we can reflect Christ to them. The second dynamic is just as important, and it's called... And it's, uh, uh, titled, Holding On to Yourself. The Apostle John records, this is from the book, the Apostle John records that prior to Jesus washing, washing his disciples' feet, he knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. All right, it's a very, very powerful statement. Another, it's one of those passages you often just read through thinking it's, it's just giving you a little context. But really it's making a powerful statement. This was right before Jesus did one of the most humiliating acts 
of service that he did in his earthly ministry. He, he got down on his hands and knees and washed his disciples' feet. He was demonstrating to his disciples what a kingdom leadership should look like. But it says, right before he did that act, that Jesus knew the Father had put him in a place of all authority, that he had power. He knew his identity. He knew where he came from. He knew his origin. He, he probably remembered being in heaven for eternity before becoming, uh, taking on human form and just, just, just meditated on that for a moment and realizing right now he's, he's stuck in the middle of a sinful world and he's about to die for these sinful people and now he's going to humble himself and wash the disciples' feet, the very disciples that will all run away and hide when he's arrested, one of them betraying him. But he got down and washed them. It was because he was firm in his identity that he was able to humble himself and serve. Jesus never ceased being God when he took on human flesh. Likewise, when we step into another person's world, we must remain ourselves. Our identity is not the change. You know, we should be secure in who we are. Uh, and this requires that we have a healthy understanding of who we are. And that we, we know who we are in relationship to God. We know where we're coming from. We know where we're going. And that, that enables us to enter into other people's lives in a safe way. Right? It enables us to hear and empathize with others, but still maintain boundaries that safeguard ourselves. All right? it, it allows us to understand and accept others, even if we strongly disagree with them. It's an important part. Have you ever been talking to someone and you strongly disagreed with them? Yeah, of course. We're all that way. Um, and there's, there's different ways people respond. Some people respond by shutting themselves down because they don't want to offend anybody. They don't want to be afraid. They don't want to go. They're so afraid of conflict. They don't, and they end up losing themselves. Or they don't want to take an opinion, but really inside they're just angry and they, they get bound up. Other people get angry and, and, and let it all out. <laughs> and that's destructive to relationships as well. Right. But if you know who you are, you know where you came from, you know where you're going, that your identity is solid in Christ, someone can say something that is completely offensive to you and you won't react emotionally. You'll understand they're just expressing what they feel. And it, this gives you an opportunity to enter into their world. You know, maybe what they feel is actually genuine and accurate from their perspective. Maybe they had experiences that you never had that made their reaction to whatever is evoking an emotional response to them rational, but you don't understand it because you haven't entered into their world long enough. You know, Jesus did not approve of the woman caught in adultery. He wasn't approving of her conduct or her lifestyle in any way. But he took time, he stopped. He knelt down. She was no doubt lying on the ground after being drugged there by the men who were about to stone her. He got down on her level and he spoke words of comfort as well as correction. He didn't accept her in the sense that, hey, just go, you're, you're, you know, you're okay, just go. No, he actually got down and communicated to her in a way that communicated comfort as well as correction. And we need to do the same thing in, for people. If we want to help people, we need to have good boundaries for ourselves so that we can represent Christ in a way that's actually helpful. If you know you are safe in your identity, you will not respond defensively when others disagree. All right? And so as soon as it gets into defensiveness, a healthy communication comes to a, a, a stop. And um, another little tidbit in this communication, if you're ever in a situation where all of a sudden it's, well, you said this, no, he said this, no, she said this, just stop the conversation. Because I've found you'll never figure out who said what. Who said, stop, whatever was said, where are you right now? How do you feel right now? And whatever was said, whatever I said before, I'm sorry, but this is what I'm thinking and feeling now. 
and it helps you bring it to the present so you can actually move forward. Very important rule. Number three, dynamic in incarnational uh, listening or incarnational communication is hanging between the two worlds. The incarnation did not bring us salvation. We celebrate that Jesus came, uh, and, and we celebrate that in Christmas. But Jesus becoming human did not bring salvation to humanity. Very, very, very important lesson. Christ's death on the cross did. When Jesus Christ was crucified wrongfully, when he took upon himself the guilt and the shame and the pain of every sin of every man, woman, and child on planet earth that ever had lived, was alive, or ever will live, when Jesus took sin of humanity on himself uh, that, and then died in our place, that's what obtains salvation for us. And when we put our faith, when we just believe that Jesus' death on the cross was the payment and the penalty uh, for our sin, when we believe that Jesus is Lord because he rescued us from our sin by taking it from us, he took not only the penalty, he took the sin. How? I don't understand. But I believe it to be true. And we, we confess faith in what Jesus did, we can access salvation. Now, we're to follow Christ, right? So Christ hung literally between heaven and earth on the cross. When they lifted him up, another Bible verse says, when Christ is lifted up, it will draw all men unto himself. When Jesus was lifted up on that cross, uh, he hung between uh, heaven and earth. Christians, likewise, are called to be the conduit between heaven and earth. It was on that moment when Jesus was on the cross and he died on the cross for our sin that he was connecting heaven, the mercy and the love of God from heaven to, to earth and, the, and the, the fallen state of mankind. And we're called in the same way to live incarnationally. Now this may mean praying for someone and seeing a miracle. And I, I love all the stuff about bringing heaven to earth. Uh, it's been really popularized by Bethel and Bill Johnson. And it's a great teaching that we are to bring the power, the, the, the majesty, the uh, miracle power of heaven to earth. Yes, absolutely. But... In this context, it more accurately means dying to ourselves for the benefit of others. As Christ died, when he hung between heaven and earth, and he gave his life for the sake of our life, we can likewise live incarnationally. And Paul kind of explains this in the context of a local congregation when he writes to the church in Philippi. He says, therefore, again, Paul was setting in prison. Paul was quarantined. <laughs> he faced a death sentence um, because of his faith. But these are the words that he was writing. Uh, he fortunately was released from prison and ended up living many more years. He, but at this point, he thought he, was about, he could die at any day or any hour. He wrote, therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if there's any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Listen, let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. This is living incarnationally. Just like Jesus, who was actually better than anyone else on the planet, humbled himself and did the lowliest act of service, which was washing the feet of his disciples, who were not worthy. One would betray him, the rest would run away. We likewise are to live incarnationally, to follow Christ by esteeming others better than ourselves. Esteeming means to value them, show respect to them. Because they deserve it? No! Because Christ died for them. Because Christ died for you. 
And, and it's through living that way that you actually create the atmosphere, the opportunity to enter into their world, to be Christ to them as Christ was to us. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, like buying enough toilet paper for yourself or groceries, but also for the interests of others. In other words, have enough to share and be willing to share and find someone that has a need and meet that need. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and has given him the name which is above every name. Powerful promise in that verse that when we live like Christ, when we humble ourselves, God will lift us up. God will exalt us if we follow Christ and live incarnationally. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, if you've never gotten to the place where you've actually made a confession of faith, that Jesus Christ is your Lord, that, that his death on the cross was the payment for your sin. And, and, and sometimes it helps to confess those individual sins, the ones that come to memory, and say that, Jesus, I believe that your death paid for my sin. And I believe that you died and you were buried. And I believe that on the third day that, the, that God raised you from the dead, that you, you were resurrected if you, if you can say, I believe that. And Lord, I commit to follow you. That's what Jesus would say uh, when he met people. He didn't say, recite this prayer. He just said, follow me. And so if you commit by saying, Jesus, I believe in you. I accept your death as penalty for my sin. I confess my sins before you. And I commit to follow you the rest of my life as your disciple, as best I can with your help. And I look forward to your return and the life that we will have in eternity in the resurrection. That's what it means to become a Christian. And if you've never done that, you can do that right now, simply by turning your heart and praying that prayer. And if you've done that, but there's been a time, a season where you haven't been living it, you need to make that recommitment. And that makes the angels in heaven rejoice when you commit your life to him. So thank you for listening to this message. Pastor Bill's going to come up and close.